Greetings Minecrafters and welcome to another Minecraft discussion on, you know, all things well-being related. So, my name is Dr. Kimberly Quinn and my role here is to help help people become the boss of their brains. Yes, exactly. Help people become the boss of their thoughts and then to, this leads us to living our very very best lives. And so today we're going to talk about how important it is, let's just say essential to smile through, you know, really hard times. And we're not saying to dismiss that we're in a really hard time because it is super important to feel and validate, absolutely. And that said, it's important to just still smile and hopefully laugh um, and have some levity because this is what truly keeps us going right there. And so, yeah, so I was insp I've been inspired by an article. I actually love the Time Special Editions. They, I actually have quite a collection of them, you know, using different articles for my Minecraft class because they're so good. Yeah, they're brief and they have a good, usually a good, you know, topic. And uh, I really like those. So I just want to give a shout out to Angela Ratledge Edmondson, who wrote Smiling Through Tri Trying Times in the Time Special Edition. And I just inspired with this here um, because it's so true. It, it, because when we're going through challenging times, it's almost like we can feel like we're not allowed to smile, shouldn't smile. Somebody's going to point fingers and say, what's she so happy about? What's he so happy about? You know, we're all supposed to be struggling here. And it's at these times that actually it's it's not just important. It's, it's essential to try to to find some levity and obviously not in inappropriate within an inappropriate context. We can seek to work, you know, kind of get work our way around to a time when it's when it's OK and to seek out that that levity. That levity is so important, especially um, within our relationships. And uh, Angela starts out, she says, let's face it, being one of those sparkling types who are perpetually ready to be delighted by the world's bounty is actually pretty easy, provided things happen to be going your way. Isn't that the truth? And this is the truth because when we get into resilience, right, resilience is, is how we adapt to you know, unfavorable circumstances, even adverse circumstances, even abusive circumstances, right? Adapting, adjusting, and, and getting um, sort of get our inner bounce back, I guess we should say, because resilience obviously isn't needed to struggle with, you know, getting that A on a paper or test, or, oh, no, help me deal with this promotion or this big, this big raise in, in my salary I just got. No, it's when things are challenging that we need, that we need to really sort of rely on and strengthen our resiliency skills and smiling something as easy as easy and simple as smiling and laughter can really help us and then she goes on to say but as for the other times like we're saying when the universe isn't cooperating which it has in a lot of ways lately has not cooperated she said it, she says and you're being served up heaping helpings of hardship grief loss and anguish well that's an entirely different story then it can seem downright impossible, or at the very least, highly inappropriate to turn a jumbo lemon into anything resembling lemonade, let alone seek a silver lying. And then she writes, for shame, the bomb of a belly laugh from the depths of your despair. So that's kind of what we're saying is that, I don't know, there's some kind of unwritten social rule or something like, how dare you, how dare you be happy when, or find, let's say, find moments of happiness and maybe even joy when there's been so much hardship, you know, between the Rona and all the deaths and casualties around that and all the suffering and all the, you know, the residual with that, all the, you know, sad five-year-olds stuck on virtual learning and um, the job loss, the basic needs not being met, all of it's just so terrible. And yet to find moments in there, we can find something, you know, uh, to, to smile about, moments in there of kindness and it's just, it's just so important. You know, at least, you know, here in the U.S., and I know across the world as well, you know, there's been a good, good couple of years where we've just had lots of political strife, confusion, tension. I don't even know what to call it. Just yuck. Let's say political yuck and violence and ongoing systemic racism. And we've just had, you know, you know, some anger, a lot of anger going on and a lot of uncertainty certainly going on. Obviously, I know lots of this is going on across the world as well. You know, you know, uh, families struggling um, to hold just to hold it together in every in every way, not just financially, but trying to manage, 
you know, uh, little kids, teenagers, the young adults were certainly hit. I know, uh, you know, teaching college, they, it was just, um, wow. And they did, they did so well, you know, not being able to socialize or date at a time of life when that's, their whole world revolves around socializing and dating. Also true for the high schoolers. I mean, just across the boards, there's been just a lot of yuck, right? And, and still, when we think about it, you know, when, when we have hard times like this, we as people often really rise to the occasion. And we don't have to look too far to see, you know, all the good stuff that happened during, during the whole Rona thing and all the other issues that were going on during, during that time as well. And uh, Angela writes one here. She, you know, she talks about the ER nurses. I mean, I can't even imagine the stress of being the medical crew d- during the whole thing. And still, the you know, some of the ER nurses posted these upbeat dance videos on TikTok, just just as a just as a way to briefly escape such intensity, you know, and and also manage to make the rest of us laugh, and you know, pro- by providing humor to us. And you know, I know myself. I I, I watched a bunch of um. I, I love music, even though I couldn't hit a note with a two by four, honestly. I think it, one of them was NYU, I, I think it was. And, and I don't even remember. Different symphonies, different people, members of symp- symphonies from across the country of the United States and world were, you know, in their houses, apartments or whatever, playing their instruments and doing these beautiful, beautiful things to, to just lift us up. And then, you know, the Saturday Night Live, some of the basement and all that stuff, lots of goodness with people donating and volunteering at food banks. It just goes on and on. So we really do, even though it's been a lot of, there's been a lot of yuck, we do have things that can make us smile, can make us, um, you know, uh, just feeling, you know, I can't think of a better word than proud. This probably is a better one, but proud that we'll, you know, that so many of us stepped up, I mean, in our own ways, we stepped up in our own ways. And then that said that we've sort of, we've continued to find moments to smile and laugh, even through such, you know, nationwide and global adversity. And we're not talking about being that Pollyanna type of person because nobody likes those people. You know, that's the person who says, somebody goes, comes up to them and says, Oh, I just lost my left arm. And then the Pollyanna responds with, oh, well, you do have another one, don't you? I mean, who likes those people? And uh, that came from Loretta LaRoche, my favorite comedian. They're just, nobody likes those people. The silver lining people. And uh, this is, you know, not empathetic. It's, it's, it's annoying is what it is. Okay, so here we go with the basics. Smiling. Smiling is the easiest thing. If you watch little kids, you know, even if we go back to the infants, right? One baby cries in a nursery and then before long, they're all crying. This is, this is much to do with mirror neurons and so is smiling. If you've ever noticed, or you can try your own little experiment, when walking down your next crowded s- street, just fake it. Put on a smile, big one. Put on a smile and watch how many people smile back at you. This is because this is the mirror neurons and it's universal. It doesn't care what color anybody's skin is, whether they have a yarmulke on, whether they are Muslim, whether they inked up with tattoos, whether they've pierced all kinds of things. Um, regardless of, of gender or sexuality, mirror neurons are, they, they're, they, mirror neurons don't, they know no bounds, okay? They are just, it's a universal thing that we all smile and then we smile back it's just what happens to human beings and when we smile it kind of tricks our brain into thinking we're happy at least momentarily you know and the other thing we can do is laugh i mean we can laugh we can synthesize laughter and you know there's there's some controversy even about synthesizing happiness is that as good as the real thing my answer is does it matter if you feel good really you know if we're if we're, if we're faking it till we make it, as we say, which is a psychological thing, um, and if you don't know, I'll just explain it this way, kind of if we're not thinking, if we're not feeling confident, we can act confidently, act confidently like we're going for the Oscar. Dress up to the nines, put yourself together, whether that's makeup or shaving something or whatever, um, put some big girl, big boy shoes on, dress for success, and then, and then walk forward with confidence. It's what we put out there, and more likely than not, that person will feel more confident. Well, that isn't different with 
um, you know, cha- shifting, making a shift in our mindset. We have to really, it's about effort. It's about good old fashioned grit. Whatever we practice, we will inevitably get good at. True in general for most things in life. So mindset is everything. We can adjust it. So we talked a little bit about that. I forget it was last time, the time before that, but about the fixed versus the growth mindset. And mindset is is just, it's the number one. We need to change our explanatory style. And I'm, I'm quite certain that you're all aware by now how much I'm a big fan of skills. And it doesn't mean, you know, that I dismiss talents because we got our Olympians fast at work right now. And uh, it's got to be fun to be them for a day, right? Especially at the end when they get to stand up on the little podium thing and get their gold medal and and that everybody sings their their own national anthem that's got to be such a rush for sure we're not dismissing talents and also a lot of effort goes in there obviously um that goes without saying though and or to be uh mozart again as we said talents are good skills though skills is also a lot of skills with the olympians just want to make sure i'm a little disclaimering we're talking about things though that we may not necessarily be good at in this moment and we can choose to be good at it we can choose to be, you know, better at it than we are now. Um, and that's true with most things, right? Playing the piano, um, cooking, learning Italian. We can choose to know more Italian today than we did yesterday. We can choose to cook, um, you know, some fabulous ethnic culinary dish that we couldn't do yesterday. We can choose to learn to play the violin. We can also choose to be more positive today than we were yesterday. We can choose to foster and strengthen our resiliency skills. And so Angela starts, she says, uh, she says also to adjust your mindset. The first step toward bolstering yourself is deceptively simple. Get proactive about it. The differentiator between those who relentlessly find moments of joy and levity, even in the most challenging times, and those who don't is small but important. It's choice and practice. See, already totally in agreement. And then she says, Bagdona says, you have to choose. Love the word choice. You have to choose to look for reasons to be delighted. Everybody, I just have to repeat it because it's good. You have to choose to look for reasons to be delighted. And more importantly, create small moments of delight for other people. I love that. Basically, Bagdonis, this person, Bagdonis, is saying, Be a good vibe because that benefits you and not only you, but those around you. Because like that old saying, misery loves company, right? We've talked about that. That is just not a true statement. Misery loves miserable company. That's how it works. The negative negative Nellies and the negative Neds out there attract more negativity. We good vibes attract more good vibes. It's just true. So you know, choosing, consciously making a choice to uh, sort of elicit delight in other people is just so important. And then there's that Gandhi thing we talked about, and I'm paraphrasing a lot here. Gandhi would say, if you're feeling blue, and we could even put that in little brackets, if you're feeling just, you know, whatever, blah, get out of yourself, get out of yourself and do something for someone. Help somebody find joy, even if it's just the smallest, simplest little thing. And I guess the selfish piece is that makes us feel better because when we do nice things for people, there is a dopamine fix. And maybe that's the universes or the source of the capital S, you know, sort of, you know, instilling that in us so that we keep doing nice things for people. Who knows? And then Angela gets kind of going on this, uh, their own version, their own version, sorry, of, uh, talking about gratitude and, and this this is so huge with mindset gratitude as we've talked about is a straight path to happiness I'm not saying there aren't other things that go into it, it's more complicated blah 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 however the gratitude thing if you put mindfulness and gratitude together you're just you've already got a great lifestyle going gratitude neurobiologically speaking rewires the brain for positivity we talked about it so if you have a gratitude journal Uh, remember, and it's okay to say it, I'm grateful for, I'm grateful for, that's all good. However, it's not going to have the power of the word. It just is not going to have the same power. So this is the easiest thing because you write, I am grateful for, you know, my dog, my partner making banana bread, this beautiful day, my health, my eyesight, whatever. I am grateful for, and those words are important. It can't just be my mom 
you know. It has to be, I am grateful for, because the neurons need this repetition and this pattern. The brain loves patterns, loves patterns. So after about 21, 21 days, average time for a habit to shift, and uh, if you want to know more about that, look up the work of Charles Duhigg. He uh, wrote The Habit Loop, I think it's called. Anyway, average of 21 days, and it gets easier, just like practicing violin or any of these other things. I am grateful for, write three things down per day, takes less than a minute, and keep your gratitude journal someplace close, and then something called the Tetris effect will kick in, which will automatically start to look for uh, positivity without you even being aware of it. It's the best thing. And the Tetris effect thing, I got to give somebody credit here, Sean Aker from the happiness advantage. So the Tetris, Tetris effect comes from the video game Tetris, or when people play that game with the shape, the different colored shapes, um, kind of Lanny try to try to organize those. Well, this happens in our brain in general. So whether you're, you know, more negative or you're more positive or somewhere in the middle, it doesn't matter. It'll, it'll start to fill in the gap. So, if you're writing, I am grateful for three things every day, you will start to automatically look for the positive in your day without even being aware of it. It's such a beautiful thing. And the, the next thing is Angela talks about embracing challenges, and that is so huge uh, because, and this also has to do with resiliency because, and I tell my students, whenever we overcome anything, it can be anything, any place from small to huge because there's all, all the spectrum thing right life doesn't just excuse me happen in polar polarized ways or absolutes there's a whole spectrum so we overcome something small that's ever you know adversarial to all the things in the middle or something huge it's like a savings account like we make a deposit in a savings account and back in the day we had these little books that we could you know when you when they'd stamp it they'd type in there i think and it would go up 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 now it's online not quite as much fun is the old school way, I don't think. But you'd watch it build, and it was exciting. As a kid, if it was even, you know, $5, it just was like, wow, I'm feeling so good about myself. And also safer. I've got some savings. And so when we overcome something, it's very similar to that. It, it, it's a self-esteem bank. So even, again, if it's a smaller thing, it's like, wow, I, I did it. And no one's saying you, you handled it in the ideal way you wish you could have. You just you handled it. You came out on top. You came out on top. You had bounce back. And each and every time we overcome something, it's making it's, it's making a deposit in our self-esteem bank, which means the next time life throws a curveball, even if it's not similar to the ones you overcame, you will be you'll you'll have this sort of inherent confidence. Oh, I, I can do this. I can do this. Even if we're not 100 percent sure, we're feeling like we're pretty sure we can do this. And also Resiliency has a self-esteem component to begin with, because even at our, when we're at our worst, darkest moments, there's something inside us that keeps us going, because something inside us is kind of sniffing out some value, even if we're, even if we're at our worst and we're not feeling valuable. That sort of desire to bounce back is coming from a place that even if there's one cell of value, one one cell of self-value in our left pinky toe, we are we're, we're sensing it, we're feeling it. And so this strengthens that as well. And so very, very important. Embrace the challenges and, and embrace the challenges because they are a deposit in the self-esteem bank. You know, and then lastly, well, she says a lot more than this, actually, but for lastly for us today, because I to keep these short, she says, kiss the guilt goodbye. And I'd say that, you know, anyway. Uh, her, her particular example, the author's particular example, is the guilt about um, being okay, having some humor during a tough time. Where obviously we're not seeing it in inappropriate times, um, you know. But to find these levity moments and to it, it, to give ourselves permission to have fun, permission to smile, permission to laugh, and permission to seek it out, permission to seek it out, because when we're surrounded by we can be surrounded by gloomy, doomy people, you know, or, in the, or we could say not gloomy, doomy people, but people who are in a gloomy, doomy place, then it's so easy to go down with that ship, just like the Titanic. And it's okay for us to seek higher ground. It is totally okay. And we have to shake the guilt for doing so because guilt in that particular instance is harmful. And I would go as far as to say crippling or, or, or debilitating. It's, not, it's at the very least unhealthy because guilt's, Guilt's job is brief. Guilt's job is to sort of hopefully prevent us from doing harmful things to other people. 
So spreading vicious rumors, punch, punching somebody in the schnozzy, um, you know, on this extreme end, slashing someone's tires or something. Hopefully guilt prevents us from doing those things. Um, and then our conscious kind of responds and then we feel horrible. We might apologize and try to fix it, reflect a little bit, like where'd that come from? I must, it must have been whatever was going on with me. I'm so sorry, blah, 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 blah. And then hopefully we're letting that go because human beings make mistakes. We all make mistakes, some small, some medium, and some big, and some super big. And it's still important to forgive ourselves and let go of that guilt because after its initial job is sort of done, and you know that whatever that is is taken care of, hanging on to that and continuing to blame ourselves and, and, and beating ourselves with a guilt club isn't un, isn't isn't healthy anyway. We need to forgive ourselves and let it go. So in Angela's uh, context here with what we're talking about giving ourselves permission to smile and laugh and seek out levity and use humor to help get us out of, you know, all this yuck that's been going on in the nation and the world and, you know, trickling into our families and into our relationships, everything else and workplaces and stuff, all the fear and uncertainty. Let go of the guilt. You officially have permission to be happy. You have permission to be happy. You have permission to smile. You have permission to laugh. And you have permission to have fun. Seek higher ground. Because other people, very soon, once you are like a trendsetter and strong and confident and you seek that higher ground, they're going to be extending their hands for you to pull them up with you. And that is the best thing. Awesome. Okay. This is Kimberly Quinn signing off from Northern Vermont. Have a mindful day.